a lot in a day and a half. And at lunch I asked my lunch crew, what, what's been missing? What else do you want to hear? And I love it. They said, no, just tell us what you're going to tell us. Yeah. But I realized that it's always helpful to have context. So I've been in Japan eight years. I went sight unseen. I didn't know anyone. Had never been a dean. Don't speak Japanese. But I had a deep commitment to the idea of value creating education. And so I went. I sold my home. I gave everything away in my house. I emailed 25 friends and I said, come with your boxes and trucks and cars and take whatever you believe is yours. And they did. It was wonderful. The reason for selling my home was that I knew if I left, if I owned it and just rented it out, when things got tough in Japan, I'd have an escape route. And I wanted to close that escape route off. It's that idea that I've heard that when people went exploring, they would burn the boats once they landed so that they could not return. They'd have to wait until someone else came to get them. Yeah, so that's what I did. <laughs> I burned my boat so that I would not flee. And it was a good thing too, because within the first two years, I thought this is the wrong place for me. I have made a big mistake. It was very challenging. And at lunch we talked about what does it mean to explore this path of value creating education? And honestly, the more I learn, the less I know. It's just been this amazing paradox that I learn, I learn, I learn, and I know less and less and less. And I think what I'm actually saying is that the complexity of this endeavor is one that is not for the faint-hearted. So if you get squeamish and you think this is a little, ah, you may not want to follow this path because you're going to end up having to ask more questions and reveal more questions rather than gain answers. But honestly, I believe that's the path. I believe it's about discovering the questions that you need to ask that haven't been asked that are going to allow you to go deeper. So in my first slide, you'll see the three topics I'm going to try to explore. Um, if we advance at one, you'll see that I want to look at the intersection of dialogue and leadership. I teach leadership at SOCA, and I'm a psychologist by training, but I did not want to teach psychology. I am passionate about leadership, and when I became dean, I made the determination, my motto, if you will, was that I would raise the next generation of global leaders. That's what I was going to do, and that's what I've been doing, and I, it's, it really is um, what I am supposed to be doing with my life at the moment. So I want to talk about and explore how dialogue has entered into my understanding of leadership and my understanding of learning. And yes, I want to see the interface with global citizenship, but that's actually almost minor right now. I, after a day and a half, I really want to be able to take us deeper into understanding dialogue. Because the one thing that I will not do is romanticize this concept. You have been hearing dialogue for 36 hours now. And my guess is that each one of you has a different definition, understanding. I want to talk about dialogue with a capital D, not a small d. Because to me, dialogue is something more than conversation. And oftentimes in the last 36 hours, the word dialogue has been used as a substitute for conversation. And we have to think differently about dialogue with a capital D. I also want to look at what are the guiding principles in this endeavor of value creating education. And what I mean are, what are my guiding principles? Parker Palmer says, you teach who you are. And that is so true. I teach who I am. You cannot separate my presence in a learning space 
from who I am as Maria. And actually, my full name is Maria Gapita Esperanza Resendez Guajardo. That's my full name. And each part of that name has a story. But you can call me Maria. So <laughs> we, will, we will, yeah, talk a little bit about what are my guiding principles. And then, actually, the request for this seminar was for me to come and share what is it that I do in the classroom. So I want to be able to talk a little bit about what I do in the classroom. So um, yesterday, I had you, I passed out these little intention cards, little envelopes. I want everyone to pull theirs out if they have it. And then once you, and then open it up, read it, look at it to yourself, read it to yourself. Okay. And then once you've done that, I want you all to stand up, everyone, because learning is not an observation sport. So get up, everyone stand up. And I want you to find the person that you are least familiar with in the room. So find the person, the least, the least. The least familiar. Everyone stand up, except maybe our camera expert. Everyone stand up and find the person, stand next to the person that you know least. That's a tough one. Everyone stand up. Everyone stand up. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Attention. Once you have found your partner, everyone must have a partner. Once you have found your partner, I want you to find two chairs and I want you to place them exactly in this position. Exactly in this position. And someone can actually come and sit in these. You can move them, but everyone pull out the chairs. You're gonna probably have to put them in the aisle. Pull out the chairs. Who does not have a partner? Who does not have a partner? <laughs> Everyone have a partner now? Van San, who is your partner? Right here. <laughs> the two of you are partners. Yeah. I want everyone to align their chairs. It has to be exactly like that. Okay. No, no, no. So pull the chairs out. Pull the chairs out. That's Put the other one right here. Yoko, go around. Go around. Go to the back of the room. And the corners are, di the diagonal corners are touching. Diagonal, you cannot do it that way because the diagonal corners have to touch. Diagonal corners have to touch. Diagonal, so hold on. I'm going to do not move the chair. You have to get right. <laughs> yeah, so this doesn't work because the diagonal corners of your chairs opposite. See how their chairs are? Gentlemen, gentlemen, stand up. The chairs in the back. Van San, the chairs have to be aligned this way. That is not like that, like this. <laughs> perfect, 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 perfect. Little closer. <laughs> perfect, perfect. So th these are the instructions. Okay, but you will turn back around, yes? Okay, so this, these are the instructions. Listen carefully. Each one of you will have three minutes to speak. One of you will be a speaker and it'll be the person with the shortest hair who will go first. The other person, your other partner, will be a listener. Now, a listener in this exercise has a very important role. Your job is to listen to understand. Your job is to listen with your heart. Now listening means you do not speak. You do not ask questions. You can demonstrate to your partner that you're listening by nodding your head. 
smiling, but you cannot say a word. You are listening. Your partner will speak for three minutes on the topic of intention and purpose. What brought you to this seminar? Why are you here? What has the experience been like? Whether you've been here a few hours or a day and a half. Person with the shortest hair will go first. I will time you so you don't have to look at your watch or your phone. At the three minute mark, I will say stop, take a breath, and switch. You stay in place. What I mean is if you were the speaker, you now become the listener. And your job is to do what? If you are the listener, your job is to? Listen. Do you ask questions? No. Oh, do you interrupt? Ah, no. <laughs> no questions, no interruptions. Do you begin to have a conversation? No. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no. It's a little comical, but I can't tell you how difficult it is for some individuals to understand that when you listen, you don't say a word. All right, three minutes. If I'm the speaker and I run out of things to say in my three minutes, does that give my partner or me permission to have a conversation? No silence. No. <laughs> that means you say, I don't know what to say. Isn't three minutes over yet? What, what do I talk about now? And your partner is going to just like, <laughs> yeah, because their job is just to listen. All right. When I say switch, if you were speaking, you begin to listen to understand and your partner will speak for three minutes. And then I will say stop, and then we'll talk about what happened. Any questions about the exercise? And the question that you're answering is, what is your intention? What, what brought you to this seminar? What was your goal? Why are you here? Or how has the experience been so far? Please keep your chairs in the right position. There was a question. Eye contact, we look at the eyes, we don't look at the eyes. You can do whatever. <laughs> Whatever a listener or speaker would do. Okay, I have a question. So if, I don't think this case, but if some, someone, the speaker, do not have like, you know, she or he has only like two minutes to speak, and then, I mean, nothing more than that, in that case, what do I do? You just sit there and you say, I don't know what else to say, no. but <laughs> it is your three minutes and no one is going to take it away and no one can borrow it. So you can do, you can sit in silence, you can sit in nervousness, you can sit however you want to use that space. All right? Okay. Other questions? Let me get my phone so I can time you. Chairs, please. Yes. Oh, my phone. Person with the shortest hair goes first. So decide. And I will tell you when to start. And go.
Donc, comme un comme avec un voix de la réalité, c'est que depuis la c'est que c'est And stop. <laughs> Silence. Take a breath. Psst. Silence. Take a breath. Take a breath. If you were <laughs> if you were speaking, you are now the listener. And the time begins. Now the speak the listener can speak. <laughs> Thank you. 
And stop. <laughs> Deep breath. So let's talk about what just happened. How was it to share when it was your turn to share for three minutes? How was it to share? Oh, I have to begin. <laughs> um, it was. You can you can turn the face yes, now just so. It was a little stressful because mm. uh, it's not like uh, I I was telling myself that I have a mission to entertain her. Mm. And I was like, okay, so it's. It's my turn, so mm -mm -mm -mm. Uh, she's listening to me and she just have to do that, so <sighs> it's better if she's not bored. <laughs> ah, so there was a sense of, of maybe responsibility yes. or wanting to be yeah. accountable for how do you fill up this space? How was it to share? Um, it was different because I'm not usually the one who shares, I'm the one who listens. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, yeah, it was different. I, I, I liked it, mm. but it was something. <laughs> so it was new? Yeah. <laughs> mm, how was it to share? Um, I think you just have to be comfortable with yourself and being with another person and just, you know, you can tell yourself things, you know the other person's gonna listen. You know, it's not really if you're talking to someone, it's like you're talking to yourself, with yourself, and there's someone right there, you know. But sometimes you don't see the other person, it's just like you're feeling something and you're just it can be anything, like I didn't really say anything, I just said a bunch of random things and, and that was it, yeah. Mm. How was it to listen? I did not expect that it would carry strong feelings on both ends. I felt as strongly, as conflicted, like the feeling was as complex when listening than when talking and yes a part of it was what he was saying but a part of it was what I was feeling about what he was saying and I was trying to really like put that aside to really like fully commit myself to the listening but that was hard. So emotions, thoughts, the experience, how was it to listen? shown that I always used to be the one who listened because this is well for me that was the best way to learn mm -hmm. so that's what I actually did I was trying to get the most out mm -hmm. of this listening experience mm -hmm. and that's pretty much I believe that's what I did I really enjoyed it how did you feel you enjoyed it yeah. mm. how was it to just listen it it forced me to to use all my attention to like remember, but not only remember, but make a link between everything that is said. So mm -hmm. I try to visualize what was happening, and sometimes I you know you listen and you understand, mm -hmm. but I try to connect the dots, like mm -hmm. he did, like the map. <laughs> yeah, 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 I yeah, yeah. To connect the dots. How did it feel to be listened to? It's difficult for me to listen and to be uh, like a poker face. Mm. <laughs> it's not me. Mm -mm -mm. You know? <laughs> when he was saying something, mm. you know, I was agree. Mm. I said, yeah, my eyes were, yeah, yeah, yeah. were smiling. <laughs> yeah, know, but yeah. It's difficult for me. I, I, mm. I, I can play poker, I'm sure. Yeah, and I didn't say you had to, you couldn't express, I didn't say you couldn't express, right? Uh, okay. But how was it to not say anything? Oh, no, that, that, that was okay. easy, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So oftentimes, and, and was very interesting. Mm, so oftentimes, <laughs> not oftentimes, we have been trained in society to be ready to ask a question, to listen and be ready to respond. To listen and be able to, you're thinking, you're thinking, ah, oh, what will I say as a follow-up to that? Or, you know, what can I, how can I interrupt? Or I want to know about this, but what happens when we interrupt? What would have happened if you had interrupted? Martins. Uh, I kind of realized that I might interrupt people too much. 
too much in my life. Mm. Uh, I, I, I have kind of a fast going brain and when people talk I tend to agree, disagree right away, mm -hmm. words, and uh, I feel it might be uh, uh, not really nice for people. So it was kind of a challenge for me, only for two minutes, to just not <laughs> any word. And yeah. I think I should definitely work on that. Mm. Yeah. We either have that tendency to want to be able to ask questions, to interrupt, but the moment we do, and the moment the dialogue partner begins to answer your questions, they are now telling the story that you want to hear, not the story that they would have said without interruption. Think about that for a moment. The moment you ask a question, you have redirected the dialogue. It's now become the, sto it becomes the story you want to hear. You're curious about this or that, and you've redirected what she would have said if left to her own devices on her own for three minutes. How often in life are you given an opportunity to be listened to uninterrupted? Vincent? I think just one feeling in one sentence, it leads you naturally to respect. That was the feeling you were... Yeah. Lead you to respect. It can be a struggle, you know, because you get yeah. happy to interact. Yes. Think about that, what that will answer. And yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. you have to keep quiet first, which mm. is not obvious to keep quiet. And then, naturally, I think it leads to respect. Mm, thank you. When I said listen to understand, what did you mean? What did you think that meant? Well, I think uh, at the beginning, it was very really hard for me to listen. Because mm. I usually don't listen that much, you understand? <laughs> <laughs> True confessions, yeah, 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 they're coming out, yes. But at the end, I realize it is an effective way to convey a message. When you listen, I mean, you give the opportunity to the person, I mean, which, with whom you dialogue in, the opportunity to say what he has to say. Yeah. But at the same time, you're learning a valuable thing. But when you interrupt the person, as you said, you kind of like shift in the conversation mm, to a mm, different mm, subject, which you will miss the, be the better part of it. You know true, I mean? true. So that's the reason why it's really important to listen. Mm. And then if we have something to say, then we may ask, can I ask now a question? Right. Because it's, it is not a difficult thing. And then, but when we interrupt, that's where things get in. Right. Did you feel you were being listened to? Yeah, for sure. And like, like everyone else, uh, not everyone else, but like, like Alex said, m for me, when I'm trying to listen to someone, I get like to invest in their story and I'm trying to finish the sentence of the other. And I know I'm doing that too much. And like, <laughs> I understand that right now mm. that it's not like, even if it's like in good, like uh, that's a it came as a good place, like I really want to understand a person, but it just shifts what they want to say yeah. to like what I want them to say. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So how often do we get someone's undivided attention without interruption to be able to tell our story? Some people pay a lot of money for this, it's called therapy. Yeah, <laughs> but imagine the opportunities in daily life are rare and far in between. When we talk about dialogue, half of dialogue is listening. And we've not heard anything about listening since we started this gathering at the beginning. Right, so how we begin to practice dialogue listening. And Vincent, that was beautiful. You said, this experience, I could feel that sense of respect. And I wasn't sure if it was being respected or feeling respectful, or perhaps both, right? But someone's undivided attention to listen to your narrative. Do you want to? 
where, where are these emotions coming from? What's behind the tears right now? Take a breath for a moment. We're just going to sit for a moment. It's okay. It's okay. It's just this entire seminar has been reaching really deep for me. Not, not necessarily in a bad way, but in some things I'm passionate about and also things I'm insecure about. So it's just, I think I fill up the gouge and now it's spilling yeah, really over. over. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. To give and create the space for the emotions to come through. No one had to go and rescue you, which is what we often do when, someone's be when someone begins to feel sadness. We rush to rescue. We say, oh, it's okay, it's okay. But think about what that's telling the person who's feeling over full of emotion. It's okay. Well, I don't know that it's okay, but it's my way to pacify, squelch, and make disappear this really precious moment of just being together in this space. So I would suggest to you that when we practice dialogue, and it really is a practice, it's not a concept that's abstract, it's not a concept that we just glorify, it's a practice that we have to engage in intentionally that when we allow ourselves to practice this, just like an athlete practices their sport, or you practice karate, or you practice music, or whatever it is that you practice, right? Just like you practice other aspects. You practice studying, you practice being a professor, you practice being a leader. It's a practice, it's an experience. And how we create the space, how we allow ourselves to hold the space, how did it feel, Yoko, to see the tears, to hear the emotion? How did it feel right now for you? Oh, I feel really, you know, I feel her sensitivity. And uh, I'm very um, grateful to share this very moment with her and with everyone here. Yes. Yeah. And her tears is really, for me, it's a sign of really sensitivity from her heart. And again, I share, I, she share, she share it with us, and I am so grateful to this opportunity and mm. this space. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Yeah, I think value creating education is creating the space to be able to be our full selves to feel respected, to feel seen. I see you, right? How did you feel when I came and I just stood here with my hand on your shoulder? And normally I would feel like not really comfortable. Mm. Normally when people touch me, I don't really like it, like when they're too close too to close. me. Mm. But in the environment that we created this past hours past day made me feel really like at peace with mm. your presence near mm. me and like I said this lunch with you like we mm. all felt that you're really a good person mm. just by your presence so the fact that it was you and you were close to me it was really fine and mm. I felt like it in peace yeah thank you let me ask you about the seating arrangement yeah you struggled a little to follow the instructions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what did it mean to you to be in this seating arrangement with someone that maybe you don't know quite as well? How did it feel? The most noticeable 
element of this like sitting ar arrangement I think is that you are used to looking in front of you when you talk to someone you, mm. you casually look at them in the eye but when the person is at like a 45 degree at an angle, angle mm. at your right you have to make an effort and <laughs> it makes the whole thing um, it's not obvious that it's like what I would have done so it reveals your intention of looking like connecting with a person and this can be you know like um, it's, it's like when you, you have a Christmas you know when you're young you have a Christmas party and you're like you go do a hug to your grandmother it's like it's 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 nice and you connect but at the same time it's like oh everyone is looking at me and i'm like being <laughs> intimate and do i look dumb yeah. <laughs> making a hug, <laughs> hug to my grandmother but in the end you're like yeah it's really precious but mm. it it forces you to confront the uh the the words it's not uncanny like in a negative sense but mm. it's um it's, it, it takes you out of your comfort zone. Yes. Yeah, that's the word. Olivier, how did it feel for you to sit in this arrangement? Uh, well, there was an external factor that, that being like this, I could see the trees, which I love trees. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I asked about eye contact. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Like, look at the trees. <laughs> mm -mm -mm -mm. Uh, but I did make sure that he knows that I'm not watching the tree, I'm listening. <laughs> so, you know, I was very comfortable, but then I was checking, hey, I'm, I'm really listening. I, mm. I'm with you, I'm mm. following so, Thank you. Very nice. Mar Martin? Martin? I'm sorry. <laughs> How do you pronounce your name? Martin. Martin. What was this exercise like for you, from beginning to end? Because you're relatively new to the space today. Yeah, and I said, everybody has to participate, and Martin is like, I'm not getting up. Mm -mm. <laughs> nope, nope, maybe if I don't move, they won't see me. Nope. <laughs> wasn't that clever? He was like... <laughs> so, how was this experience for you? Yeah, sharing, the seating, tell us. Can I say it in French? Then uh, you can... Uh, sure, sure, no problem. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Je ne sais pas si certains d'entre vous sont familiers avec la confession, mais moi, ça me rappelle un exercice de confession. Do you uh, anybody is uh, familiar with the Catholic confession? That which role where you you say everything to the priest? Okay, but he remembers that. Yes. Ça va en confession. Le prêtre est comme ça, le curé est comme ça. So the the priest uh, receives all the sins and mm -hmm. it doesn't mm -hmm. change, it just mm -hmm. listens and receives all the sins. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's very, very similar. <coughs> the exception is that um, Alex didn't have time to say all his sins. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but the situation is the same. Yeah, 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 yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I love that. I love that sense. And that connection to to a spiritual path, a spiritual practice. Yeah, having grown up Catholic, I absolutely know that experience. Yeah, I, as a little girl, I used to make up my sins because I thought there's probably good sins and bad sins. So I would go to confession and, and try to think of the good sins that I could share. I would make them up. Can you imagine? Yeah. <laughs> All right, get back to your seats. Get back to your seats. <sighs> Thank you for doing that exercise. Bravo. Bravo. It's a good uh, ah. exercise. Very good. It's three o'clock now. But I'm going to keep going for maybe 15 minutes and then we'll take a break and then we can come back for discussion, yeah? And then if I can 
advance this. Oh, I don't know how to do it. It's it's user friendly. Program. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh. User <laughs> okay, so what I'd like to do is just sort of bring that exercise into what we just did. So for me and for others, di and for Daisaku Ikeda, dialogue is a transformational experience. Dialogue is not transactional. Transactional exchange is called a conversation. That's different. A conversation is different than a dialogue because Daisaku Ikeda and many other scholars say dialogue is transformation. Paulo Freire, one of the greatest educators from Brazil, says dialogue is not ping pong. You talk, I talk, you talk, I talk. That's not dialogue, that's conversation. Dialogue requires intentionality of being in the space with someone and being willing to listen, to understand, and allow yourself to then recreate, unlearn, relearn relative to your own beliefs and opinions. It's relational. Right? And yesterday there was the comment, well, it can be a relationship with myself. Absolutely. It's relational. It's this idea that you're engaging. It ha requires intention and purpose. Yeah, so we've already started that. And I'm not the only one saying that uh, here at the seminar. And I would suggest to you that it also requires trust. So you shared, well, there was a trusting space here. So it was okay for the physical proximity. The vulnerability, just allowing yourself to, to emote, to be you, to express that, those feelings, right? It takes a lot of strength and a lot of courage to be vulnerable, to not just sort of keep it all inside. And sometimes we just can't help ourselves. It's, we're bubbling over. We're bubbling over, right? But the sense of trust and vulnerability is required in dialogue. And if we had more time, I'd... Yeah, I had intended to tell you how each one of these four concepts is also part of leadership. But the most important thing is that dialogue is an experience. And it's a process. It's what we have to practice over and over again. Daisaku Ikeda says, if we go back one slide, Daisaku Ikeda says, genuine dialogue results in transform transformation. Right? We just talked about it. it. You're going to be different as a result of the experience. And I like, if we go to the next one, I like Peter Senge's definition of leadership. And I would propose to you that dialogue does the same thing. Leadership is the capacity of a human community to shape its future. I believe dialogue plays a role in this shaping. Right? And Peter Senge very clearly says it's a human community. It's about who we are at lunch on our walk in search of lunch, survival food, yeah. Uh, <laughs> we talked about why is community important? And I would suggest to you that it's, it's where we are seen. It's where we are known. It's where we are visible to someone else, not just a number, not an enrollment figure. It's where we are seen and where, other, where we see others. And so this is about purpose. We heard this morning that dialogue and peace, it's for some reason. Social justice, bettering the future, the greater good, it's about shaping the future, right? And we participate in this process as a result of dialogue. So this is where I would say, and I like the word interface. I, yeah, today I want to use interface as opposed to intersection. Because interface is the connection of systems. It's the connection of concepts. And for me, it's the idea that we're com connecting both the individual with the global. If we're talking about global citizens, if we're talking about a larger self, if we're talking about the others that we were mentioning at lunch, it's about being able to see ourselves as part of the other. Ubuntu, Namrata shared that concept this morning. I am because we are, and we are because I am. I love that phrasing Ubuntu. because, huh? Ubuntu. Mm. I love that phrasing because it allows me to understand my connection to all of you, but also to differentiate and be unique for who I am and how I am. So I am because we are, and we are because I am. 
the idea that we're shaping that future, that creative coexistence, and then this idea of accountability and responsibility. Once you have become part of this path, you know too much to go back <laughs> to not knowing, to pretending you don't know. And I would suggest to you that all of you today, at this moment, know too much to go back to pretending you don't know. We do have a sense of responsibility for one another, for ourselves and for each other. We hold each other accountable and we're, there's a sense of responsibility. How do we connect? How do we pull and hold on to others? Whether it's that three-year-old you dropped off at school or the community that you have back home, right? How do we keep that engagement alive? So how do I take this then back into the classroom? Well, I'm not gonna go through the details, but for the classes that I teach, Global Leadership and Dialogue, Women, Culture and Leadership, Democracy, Social Justice and Dialogue, I bring Daisaku Ikeda's uh, printed textbooks, I mean printed dialogues, like the one we saw yesterday, Gorbachev and Ikeda. I bring those, tech, those dialogues as textbooks into my classes. And then the purpose is to look at the big themes. So th this is a whole list of dialogue books that I've used. But the themes, if we go to the next slide, the idea is to pull out these themes. So democracy and social justice, or Red Nanda, who is a human rights lawyer, uh, global citizens, Ambassador Chowdhury, how do we pull out this idea of the culture of peace? So, so these are just some of the themes we even, I'm teaching a class this semester on psychology of leadership, which is just like the best class to teach because I'm looking at creativity and I'm looking at it through the lens of positive psychology. So Chiksen Mihai, who's a positive psychologist, wrote the book Flow, F-L-O-W, on optimal experiences. And he connects that to leadership. So that's the textbook we use for the first half of the semester. Second half, we use the dialogue between jazz musician Herbie Hancock, Wayne Shorter, and Dai, uh, Daisaku Ikeda. And we talk about creativity and leadership and innovation. <gasps> it is the best class, psychology <laughs> of leadership. So those are the themes. And the reason I take these themes is, if we go to the next one, is to be able to connect it to what it is that I believe in the learning space. So I thought, and I began by saying, we teach who we are. I teach who I am, right? The, how do I bring that into the classroom? Well, these are the guiding principles of how I show up. I absolutely believe that the learning space is sacred. Absolutely believe that. Yeah. There's nothing else to say about that one. Um, I believe about, Learning happens when I'm able to connect head and heart. Just head stuff is important to many. That's the knowledge. But unless I can connect it to what matters to me, it's knowledge that I'm going to forget really fast. Yeah, my students, after they take a midterm, well, I don't do midterms, but after they've taken midterms and finals, I'll say, well, what was it on? And they'll say, I don't know. <laughs> I just memorized a lot before the final, right? It's like, it goes out, but if you connect head and heart, that's where real learning, I think, happens. I believe that the purpose of education is to allow others and myself to continue to discover my voice and our truth. What is our truth? How do we bring our lived narrative into the classroom? and connect it to those themes, those big ideas. So that's what I do in the classroom. I believe the purpose of education is to become more human. And it starts from the moment I'm designing my syllabi to, yeah, the final. Um, and some ideas of what finals look like in my class. And, and education requires a community. Yeah, that's, that's also a given. If we go to the next one. So what do, what do we do? What do we do? How do I go through this? So for me, critical thinking, I used to really be on that bandwagon until I thought, you know, my students are doing much more than that. I want them not to feel like they have to know the answers. I want them to really feel courageous to ask the questions. What questions need to be asked so that we can go deeper into understanding what the content is, what the, what the purpose of the, of, the, of the learning is? So, how do we ask the deep questions? It has to be, learning has to be relevant. 
We heard Namrata say that. You said that yesterday, Olivia. I mean, it has to connect to our life. So that sense of relevance, purpose and intention. How many times have you heard me say this, right? The why, why are we here? Why do we do what we do? Why, Where, what is your purpose? What is your North Star? Whether you're an educator or plan to be an educator or go into a different field, I would suggest that we have to continually ask, what is my North Star? Why do I do what I do? And in class with my students, it's about being able to bring out that sense, that agentic self, that sense of empowerment, although I don't like using that word, but it's that sense of agency. Who are you as someone in, in the world right now that can do and create on your own and with others? So that's the experience. And then the next slide just begins to reflect some of the projects that my students do. They write peace proposals. They connect to the SDGs, which we heard this morning. In one class, I had my students design social movements. I said, you can pick whatever you want, but in a small group, you design a social movement. And they're like, what? And it's incredible. They do it. They do it. Um, so this is the kind of stuff we do in the class. Structured dialogues, every course, every class, my students will do some type of dialogue similar to what you just did. Similar to what you just did. And at first, it's really challenging. Yeah, they cheat. They start talking. They have conversations. And they look to see if I can see them. Yeah. <laughs> but by the end, the biggest takeaway is that they will always say, I learned how to listen. That's the biggest takeaway. I learned how to listen. And this is international conference that's happening this week. Namrata speaking there. I'm speaking there. There's a number of people. It's on global citizenship. And my students, I said, they're going to have a global booth. It's sort of like this learning space. You, you guys decide what you want to put into it, and you create it. So they're doing that now. So the idea is to take what we're learning, to apply it and make it relevant to our lives, to ask, what is my role in this new knowledge? And can I co-create and develop additional knowledge? That's, that's my goal. How do we keep creating that? And then, I think the last slide, persistent questions and challenges. So these are questions I'm always asking. Who's missing in the conversation, whether it's on leadership or social change? Who is missing from the table? Women, global citizenship education, the, the work in that area has excluded women up and down and left and right. So how can we talk about global citizenship and not include women in the conversation? Yeah. So I'm always asking, who's missing? Why does culture matter? How does it matter? Namrata talked about or mentioned it this morning. It's really a deep understanding of how does culture, how does your cultural experience to date influence and shape your worldview? And it does. How how well are you able to identify it and speak of it in order to be able to continue to take more informed steps in terms of the work you do? For what purpose? And then student agency. So much of what we do in class is to unlearn, relearn, and learn anew. Um, I believe everyone should be challenged. And so at lunch, I said, please ask me the hard questions. Criticize everything I say. Part of it is, how do we continue to learn with one another? So that's what I wanted to share with you in terms of dialogue, leadership, global citizenship. It's an experience. It's a process. It's a practice. It's not static words on a piece of paper or on a PowerPoint. I think it's break time, or we can take some questions. It's up to you. Thank you. Thank you.